Through this word, I will grow. By this word, I will triumph. In this word is my future. This word is real life. In Jesus' name, amen. As Pastor Mary Beth said, talking about identity shift tonight. Sometimes people think of themselves as losers, misfits. People think of themselves as failures. Um, people think of themselves a little bit higher on the level as just ordinary, expendable, ordinary, not important. And you think of other people who have uh, important positions, maybe in government or other areas of life, and you think of yourself as not quite so important. But in the eyes of God, every single person is necessary, called with a purpose, and important. And if it was only one of the people who think they're the least important people on the face of the earth, if that was the only person alive, Jesus still would have died for them. Because he considers everyone valuable. He calls us a, uh, a peculiar people in the King James, which means a precious people. A precious, purchased possession. We've been purchased with a price. And we need to understand our identity to get a new identity, to shift from a natural identity to a spiritual identity, to shift from a failure identity to a successful identity, so that we can see who we are in Christ. And it, it begins here um, in Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, coasts just meaning the edge of this district. This is inland. It's nowhere near the sea. Caesarea Philippi is the area today we call Banyas up in the Galilee, so it's not anywhere near any water. He asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say that you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He says to them, But who do you say that I am? Now this is key. Unless we can accurately identify Jesus, we cannot identify ourselves. We must first be able to identify who Jesus is before we can identify who we are or how we fit into his plan or God's plan. There are millions of people who populate churches who don't have a clue who Jesus is. They know he was a good man. They know he's a prophet. They know he's the son of God. They know all the names, but they don't know him. Can you describe someone's identity if you've never met them? You can, you know, there are people today that are vilified in the press. But every time someone gets to meet them personally, they come away and say, There's no, they're nothing like what we read about. They're nothing like what we hear about. It doesn't matter what others are saying, including the devil, or your own mind about you. What is God saying about you? We identify ourselves by identifying Jesus first. And the only way we can identify him or know his identity is by knowing him. So Jesus is asking this question for a reason. He's not just asking for no purpose. He has a specific reason here, which I'm going to reveal or show or, or talk about. The, the place he chooses is interesting as well. Um, Pastor Ray Beth put in the bulletin this past week that I've been asked to do two chapters in a Bible handbook. One chapter is on the effects of Hellenism. The other chapter is uh, a chapter about the um, Maccabees and Hasmoneans. They're the same people. The Maccabee is uh, the Greek version of Hasmonean family. Anyway, Hellenism. Hellenism is the effect of Greek culture on non-Greek people. It all started after Alexander the Great went through there. This area, Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea is not a Jewish word. Philippi is not a Jewish word. Philippi is a Greek word. After Philip, king of Macedon, who was Alexander's father. Now, this spot was a spot where Greek gods were worshipped. So Jesus is taking them to a place where Greek gods were worshipped, healing gods, and nat nature gods, Pan, the god of nature, Pan. That's why today it's called Banyas. It, it should be Panyas with a P, but in Arabic they have no letter P, they have a B. So everywhere there's a P, like my last name, Poli Castro, in Arabic is Boli Castro. They just say a B instead. So this is Banyas. Jesus takes them there into a place that represents 
Hellenistic culture, Greek culture, and asks, who do people say I am? Who do you say I am? Now, Peter accurately says, then Simon Peter. Okay, very important. The Bible says Simon Peter. That's an example of Hellenism. His name, his Hebrew name is Simon, but he has a Greek name, Peter. In this article that I wrote, there was a high priest named Onias who changed his name to Jason. That's Hellenizing. Now, is Hellenizing a bad thing? It can be. But not always, because it was Hellenization that caused the Old Testament to be translated into Greek, which we call today the Septuagint. And the New Testament is not written in Aramaic, the language they spoke, nor is it written in Hebrew, their ancestral language is written in Greek. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. So Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, your Bible says Christ. That's the Greek version of Messiah. And since it's written in Greek, Christ is written here. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Now, Jesus does not use his Greek name. He uses his Hebrew name, Simon Bar-Jonah. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. So he tells him right here, this is a divine revelation. The only way we can know the identity of Jesus is by divine revelation. At some moment in time, you went from knowing about the Lord to knowing him personally. I sat in church for years not knowing him, but knowing about him. I never knew you needed to be born again. I never knew what that meant. I never even read that in the Bible. And then one day, after hearing about it from other people over a course of time, I was challenged by a speaker but more importantly, moved by the Spirit of God to get to know him personally, to identify with Jesus. And at that moment, I got a revelation of God that I had never had before. And that's just the beginning. Once we're born again, our life is a life of continual revelation. The Word of God says we go from glory to glory. Every revelation is a glory. Every time I get a revelation, and almost every time I'm preparing a message, and every time I'm delivering a message, I'm getting revelation, either in preparation or as I speak. That's glory. That's the glory of God revealed. When you get a revelation, reading the Word of God, revelation praying, revelation holding fast to confession of your faith, or maybe even just out of nowhere, driving down the road, you get a revelation from God, that's the glory of God invading your space, invading your life. Directing, changing, guiding, showing, revealing. So, he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, using his Hebrew name. How far do you think Hebrew money could be spent at that time? Well, let me ask this. What kind of money did they spend in Israel at this time, at the time of Jesus? What kind of money did they spend in Israel? Did they have Jewish money? They did, but they didn't use it very much. They used it in the temple. They had Roman coins and Greek coins. If you took your Jewish money and you went up to Antioch, could you spend it? No. But if you took your Roman or your Greek money, you could spend it there. The Hebrew influence was limited. The Hebrew language, Aramaic language, limited. But Greek could be spoken throughout the entire empire. Do you know that even in Rome, the Romans were all fluent in Greek? They spoke Latin, they wrote in Latin, but they're all fluent in Greek. Greek was the language of culture, and Greek was like English is today. You can go to every single country of the world, and you may not find that everybody speaks English, but somebody, somewhere, in every single country will speak English today. You'll find that somewhere. Air traffic controllers in Egypt use English. Air traffic controllers in Thailand use English. Air traffic controllers in America use English. They don't use the native languages. They use English. And here, he's using his Hebrew name, but he's about to shift his identity. And I say also to you that you are Peter. 
How many times do people get their names changed in the Bible? Let's think about that for a moment. Abram was changed. Abram was changed to Abraham. His name was changed to meaning a prince with, of God, a prince of God. His name was changed, father of many nations. Father of many nations. Why? Because that was the promise to him. He identified with the promise by the name change. Sarah to Sarai, same thing, because of a promise of God. Then we look at Jacob, which means something like supplanter, changed to Israel. The name was changed according to the promise of God. His identity changed. He was no longer somebody who beat others out for a deal. He was now someone who ruled and reigned with God. Abram was no longer the childless one, the barren one. He now was a father of many nations. The name changed, identified. Look at Saul, not Saul the king, but Saul the apostle, changed to Paul. Saul, the Hebrew name, Paul, the Greek name. And now, Simon Barjona is being referred to by Jesus as Peter, his Greek name. And upon this rock will I build my church. Now, there are some denominations that believe that rock is Peter. I don't believe the rock is Peter. I've taught for some time that I believe the rock is the rock of revelation. The revelation of identity in Christ. Who he is. It all started with him saying, who do you say I am? And it's in that revelation. You are the son of the living God. You're the Messiah. It's in that revelation. Getting to know God identifying with Jesus. I believe that's what the church is built on, but something more here. Something more. It's also built on this identity shift. I believe that as Simon Bar-Jonah, his reach for the gospel would have been limited. But as Peter, his reach went beyond the coasts of Israel to the Greek-speaking world. God changed his worldview from Galilee, Judea, to the entire world. When we identify with Christ, our worldview changes. When we identify with Jesus, we have a much higher calling than we ever imagined. We have a much greater purpose than we could ever, ever have imagined. We sell ourselves short. We think less of ourselves than what God thinks of us. We don't believe we are as qualified as God believes we are. We don't believe that we have as much to do as he believes we should do. And here, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Simon Peter's ministry as Peter is to the world. He ends up in Rome. He doesn't stay in Israel. He ends up in Rome, as Paul ended up in Rome preaching the gospel. He went around the world bringing the gospel to people, sharing the gospel. And furthermore, have you ever wondered, people would say, well, how, how do you know God? How do you know God? How can you know God as a spirit? How can you know God? Think about all the gods and goddesses of either the ancient world or the modern world. I mean, India has 330 million gods and goddesses. In the ancient world, they had 12, basically, in Greece and in Rome. Others had certain ones. And they all had attributes. They all had certain attri attributes, meaning what they were known for, like Zeus. Zeus was known as the lawgiver, and you always pictured with a thunderbolt. Poseidon was the god of the sea, so I think he had a trident. I don't know, I, don't, I guess you spear fish with it. But they all had some sort of an attribute. Well, what about God? Moses said... Who shall I say sent me? I am that I am. Tell him I am sent you. Well, how do you know God like that? Moses knew him a fire in a burning bush. Knew him as the smoking, smoldering top of Mount Sinai. Knew him and he said, show me your glory. And he, 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 he glimpsed a portion of his glory and he became filled with that glory. But what about God's identity? Did he know God's identity? He knew what God wanted from him. He knew what the Lord told him to do. He knew what he shouldn't do. 
But what about his identity? And that's the second part of this revelation. Jesus is the identity of God. Jesus came to give us an a way to identify with God, the creator of the universe. In the Old Testament, they feared God as one who they constantly had to sacrifice. In the New Testament, we know God as a God of love, one who forgives because of the blood of Jesus. But when you see Jesus, he even said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is how we identify with the unseen God, the one who was and is and is to come, the God who's a spirit. By identifying with Jesus, we see when Jesus heals the sick, we know God heals the sick. When Jesus raises the dead, we know God raises the dead. He said, whatsoever I see my Father do, that's what I do. Whatever we see Jesus do, that's what the Father does. That's who the Father is. He's the one who had time for the children and said, let the little children come to me. He's the one who turned water into wine. I mean, upending chemistry, chemical chemistry and time. Simply because he's at a wedding and they needed, and the wedding wasn't over and they ran out of wine. He raised a little boy from the dead who was on his way to be buried. He raised a girl from the dead who had just passed away. This is our God. This is what he does. If we want to know what pleases him, well, what did Jesus ask us to do? If we want to know how he moves, how did Jesus move? Think of when they, Jesus is in the synagogue and they said, we've never heard anyone talk like this. That's the word of God. Through the mouth of God. We identify God through the acts and the words of Jesus. What he says is what God says. What he does is what God does. And when we know him, we know the Father. If we can identify with Jesus, we can then move on to identify ourselves. Because he goes on to say, as the Father is in me, and I in you. So now, he spreads that to us. What the Father is doing through him, he wants to do through us. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. If that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us, he makes us alive to the supernatural realities in the Lord. If we can identify who he is, we can identify who we are because he dwells in us. He is in us. He is in us for good and not to hurt or harm. I know the plans I have for you, they're for good. Not to, they're to heal. They're to prosper. Not to kill, not to harm. That's why, if you remember, was it um, Oral Roberts used to say all the time, God is a good God. God is a good God. Was he the one that said that, or did he say something other? I think it was him that was said it. I, I, I wasn't really... God is great. Yeah. And he's good. <laughs> he's great, and he's good. The, the Muslims say that too. Allah Akbar, God is great. But God is good. Do we know that? Do we know? Do we have that identity? Because then we can move on to our identity. So, if Jesus is healing, that's why he says to us, greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. He goes to his Father to send his Spirit, that his Spirit can be in us as he was in him. Do you think he needed... Let me, let's analyze this a little bit. Do you think Jesus needed the Holy Spirit without measure when he was in heaven before he came? Do you think Jesus needed the Holy Spirit without measure in heaven after he ministered on the earth? Now, if the Holy Spirit came upon him at that moment of baptism, that would mean that he wasn't upon him in that same measure until that moment. I'm talking about his flesh body. Which means that he said, it's better for me that I go to my Father. It's better for you, I'm sorry, that I go to my Father. Because if I go not, I cannot send the Holy Spirit. Which means now he has given us everything he had to minister with. He has given us the power of the Spirit of God. The same Spirit 
that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. He has sent that spirit so that we would now identify ourselves as mountain movers. We would not identify ourselves as bottom feeders. Identify ourselves as mountain movers. See yourself as not only valuable, but powerful. Not weak, not unable, but able and strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We should be exercising our God-given rights. The enemy wants to keep us ignorant and keep us down through ignorance. But when we identify, not with the weakness that we used to be, but with the power that we are in Christ, we will begin to step out of that old shell of failure and step into a new ID of success. We are who God has created us to be, made us to be, empowered us to be through the blood of the Lamb. It's not without Jesus. It's because of Jesus. It's with Him. It's totally with Him. It's not outside of the Word of God. It's based in the Word of God. Jesus goes on to say, And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You see those keys in papal insignia. I don't believe it's just the popes that have that. I don't believe it's just for a certain few. He says, Whosoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That's literally out of the Greek. Whosoever you bind, whatsoever you bind on earth, having already been bound in heaven, is bound. Whatsoever you loose on earth, having ever already been loosed in heaven, is loosed. What's bound in heaven? Do you think there's anybody sick in heaven? Do you think anybody's dying in heaven? Do you think anybody's crying in heaven? Do you think anybody's in pain in heaven? Do you think there are any broken hearts in heaven? That's all bound. What is in heaven? Think there's joy in heaven? Think there's health in heaven? Do you think there's power in heaven? Do you think there's praise in heaven? Rejoicing? Worship in heaven? What we're doing here is practicing. And he says, Whatsoever shall be loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He's given us keys. Keys to what? The kingdom of God. What are keys? What do you use keys for? To open the door. Open the door to God's blessing. Open the door to God's power. Open the door to be with God. Open the door or close the door. Close the door to your unbelief. Close the door to your, faith, to, uh, your, your doubt. And because you have the key, when doubt comes knocking, you can keep, lock them out. When unbelief comes trying to break in the door, you just lock the door. Don't let it in. But we have these supernatural keys. Key, when, when you have a key to something, let's say, do you remember, I don't know if you remember, but if you've read about in World War II, um, the Japanese and the Americans and the Germans all had secret codes that they would use to pass messages because they knew everybody was listening. Well, very quickly, we cracked the Japanese code and we were reading all their messages. And when the turning point at Midway, that battle in Midway, it was a turning point in the Pacific War. It was because we knew exactly when and exactly where and exactly how they were going to attack, and we entrapped them, waited for them. And then you have the, the Germans. They had a machine with like a gazillion different combinations. It's called an Enigma machine. Everybody knows about that Enigma machine? Well, we're praying for Poland this month, or this week. The Polish cracked the code before the war even started. They had a copy of the machine. They cracked the code. But then they were invaded, so we couldn't get that information. Somebody smuggled it out, and it was on a submarine, if I remember. And we captured the submarine somehow, and we get this Enigma machine. So there was a place in Great Britain called Bletchley Park where they had this machine, and they were reading all of the directives. And this is why uh, Rommel in, in North Africa lost because every time, after we got a hold of this machine, every time he was going to attack, we knew where he was going to attack, when he was going to attack, and how many troops he was going to use. And he was writing back saying, it's as if they know what I'm about to do. Yes, we did. Now, how about our codes? You all know about our codes? We use Native American. I think, were they Apache? Navajo. Navajo, that's right, Navajo. And nobody could figure it out. Not even Americans. You had to have an Navajo on this side, an Navajo on that side in order to, to translate. We didn't use a machine. We didn't use high tech. 
we used an ancient language that was, they had no idea what was going on. So there's a reason I was telling that story. Anybody remember what it was? I, got, I, got, I just love the story. I got involved in it. But I know there's a reason. Hopefully the Lord's going to bring me back to that reason. <laughs> what was that? Pardon, I can't hear you. Key, key, key. Thank you, the key. The Enigma machine, they had the key. There were really, literally, millions of combinations, but if you had the key, you could read everything, and they had the key. Just think. Millions of revelations from God. And I'm not talking about the book of Revelation. Every day. How much do you think God speaks every day? We can't picture God speaking with a mouth like we speak. I picture God with words coming from him in every direction like glory. Revelation. He must give like a zillion revelations a minute. We've got to scoop them up. But if we don't have the key, we don't understand any of them. If we don't have the key, we can't receive them. It's like a code. But if we have the key, and he gave us the key, I'm giving to you the keys of the kingdom. So when we hear something from the Lord, get up and bake a cake at 3 a.m., it's like, oh, okay, is that the Lord? Yes, it's the Lord. Okay, I'm going to bake a cake. When we hear something, I want you to drive down this street now. I believe that's God. We're going to go that way. You get a revelation. When the Lord speaks to you from the word of God and gives you a revelation from his word, you can trust it's God. You have a key. You know the code. You decipher it. You understand it. How many of you remember before... I, let me tell you, in my case, before I got saved, did you ever, before you get saved, try to read the Bible? I mean, I can't tell you how many times I got this Bible and I was sat down and I was determined to read it. I don't know why. I just felt I wanted to read it. And how many of you did what I did? You started at Genesis because it's the beginning of the book and it's a book. So you start at Genesis. And I, you know, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, all that's pretty good. And then I got to the begats part, you know? And we got this one, and we got that one, and we got that one, and we got that. And it lost me. The begats, I always got lost in the begats. And I, I just didn't understand it. I couldn't understand what, it was like a code. After I got born again, even the begats make sense. God gives me revelation on the begats. Speaks to me. From every single portion of the Bible, I can get revelation by the Spirit of God. There is not one word in God's Word expendable. Not one word in God's Word we don't need. And not one word in the entire book of the Bible, every book of the Bible, that He will not speak in revelation to us. It can be something that is absolutely you don't think that He could ever use. He will use it. Because the Spirit of God is the author. He put it there. When we identify with God, we'll know who we are. When we identify with Jesus, we'll know what we're called to be, called to do. Our identity is going to shift just as surely as it shifted from Simon to Peter, from Saul to Paul, from Abram to Abraham, from Jacob to Israel, from Sarah to Sarai, or Sarai to Sarah. It's going to shift with the will of God. It's going to shift according to the word of God. And it's going to shift us into a place where we become who God's called us to be. Each of those people became God's person after they made their identity shift. You don't, by the way, you don't need to change your name, okay? I don't want anybody to go around and start changing your name. You've already been changed. You're a new person already. You can keep the old name. You're already a new person in Christ. New creation. New outlook. New outcome. New purpose new goal, new character, in Jesus' name. Amen.